How's everyone doing today? Hey, would you do me a favor? Give a good round of applause to our ministry team that leads us in worship every week. Would you do that for me? So grateful for the gifted men and women in this faith family and how they serve Jesus and encourage us to do that and lead us in worship. Just a great thing. For the last few weeks, we have been looking at Jesus and listening to his words. I want to remind you as we go through today that Jesus is in spiritual warfare with the leaders of the very nation that he belongs to. He is engaged in spiritual combat with the very men who are supposed to be leading Israel to a relationship with God. And yet God himself is standing before them and they do not know who he is. A few weeks ago, Jesus began describing who he is. We're going to look at seven ways, seven descriptors of our Savior and how he defines himself, how he describes himself. I want to encourage you. I hope it helps you as we move through this. We began by looking in John chapter 6 where Jesus said that I am the living bread that came down from heaven and I am the bread of life. And then we moved into John 8 and Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And he talked about how we are living in a spiritually dark and spiritually depraved time, just like today in our country. And then he said the most audacious statement, the one that they called him a blasphemer for. He said, I am God. I am eternal God. And then... Last week, we looked at yet another descriptor of our Savior when he said, I am the light of the world. Today, we're going to look in John chapter 10. So if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to please open them up to John chapter 10 as we continue our odyssey through this amazing letter, this amazing book written by one of Jesus' disciples. As we move through this, I want to encourage you to see Jesus Now, because our text today is rather lengthy, I'm not going to read it for you now. Instead, I'm going to just walk you through expositorily each verse, and I want you to hear the words of our Savior. As we do that, I want to remind you that the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God lives forever. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for being the only true God. You've taken all the guesswork out. And I'm so thankful that you are the only God. There is no other. I'm so grateful for the book that I hold in my hands. And because it came from you, it can be nothing less than what you are. You are truth. Therefore, the book that I hold in my hands, the Bible that this faith family holds in theirs is truth Jesus I pray in this tumultuous season that we find ourselves in the United States I pray we would look to you for wisdom for guidance for truth thank you for being truth you can be nothing less than your Heavenly Father because you're God Holy Spirit, God has given you the tremendous authority to lead his church. I'm so grateful. There's not one person in this room that can say I am the leader of Kathleen Baptist Church. You are. And we bow to you. We worship you, Father. Holy Spirit, would you lead us now? As we walk through the words of our Savior, help us to hear Jesus speak. And it's in your name, Jesus, that I pray these things. Amen. So let's begin by looking at John chapter 10, and we're going to start in verse 1. I've entitled this that Jesus is the Good Shepherd. And there are four key things that I want you to see in this text as we move through 
Jesus' conversation with the Pharisees, the scribes, the chief priests, and the Sadducees. The first is that Jesus is the true shepherd. He is the true shepherd. Look in verse 1 with me. Jesus says, truly, truly, in the Greek it's amen, amen, which means truth unto truth, I say to you. He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. If you look on the screen behind me, you will see an illustration. It is broken into two parts. The part on your right, guys, if y'all can show the slide for me. There we go. The part on your right is a sheepfold. In ancient times, they would build what you see there. About The walls would be about three and a half to four feet tall. And they would put it just outside of town. And in the middle of that, you see a door. And you see a man in the door. That is the entrance to the sheepfold. And the shepherd or the gatekeeper would sit in that door and overnight they would sleep in that door so that the sheep would never venture out. The picture on your left is what a sheepfold looks like in town. It looks a little bit different, but it's what it would look like in town. It would be between two buildings in the marketplace or between two homes in ancient Jerusalem or other cities in the Mideast. And again, you can see the shepherd standing in the doorway at evening time. The gatekeeper, most oftentimes, would be the one who would sit down in that doorway of the sheepfold to keep the sheep inside. No one would come in and out without going through the gatekeeper, except the thief who sought to take the sheep out of the pen, and he would have to climb over the walls in the cloak of darkness in order to be able to do that. That's what Jesus is saying here. He who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. Verse 2, but he enters by the door, is the sheep, or is the shepherd of the sheep. The shepherds would enter into the sheep pen or the sheep fold. They would leave their sheep overnight there, and the next day they would go in and pick their sheep up and carry them out to graves and pastures. Verse 3, to him the gatekeeper opens. The gatekeeper would know the shepherd, and he would open the, and get up and open the door for him or move out of the way for him to go in and acquire his sheep. The sheep hear their shepherd's voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. Look at John 10, verse 27. Jesus continues, and he says this, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Remember, there are only two types of people in the world. People who have a relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible calls them Christian. People who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and the Bible calls them enemies of God, sons of disobedient, objects of God's wrath. They are called non-Christians. Only Christians, children of God, hear the voice of God and follow Him. So my question for you today as we walk through this is, as a sheep of Jesus Christ, do you know your shepherd well enough so that when He calls your voice or when He calls, you recognize His voice? Do you have such an intimate relationship that when Jesus is ready to lead you, Do you recognize his leadership? And as Jesus is moving through this amazing picture, he helps us to understand who he is and who we are. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. Verse 4, when he has brought out all of his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Sheep are amazingly dumb animals. And I find it fascinating that God calls us sheep. There's a message in there somewhere. You just have to smile, because if you think about it long enough, we're just like sheep. But a sheep knows his leader, and he follows that leader. He will not follow anyone else. He will not listen to the call of any other shepherd. But when a shepherd calls, either by name or a whistle or some type of 
audible signal the sheep would follow their shepherd and they would stay close with him they would not follow a stranger in fact they will run from a stranger if the stranger tries to lead them look at verse 6 this figure of speech Jesus used with them but they did not understand what he was saying to them now those words figure of speech in the Greek it means difficult to understand it means a veil see Jesus is speaking spiritually to the leaders of Israel the Sadducees the Pharisees the chief priests and the scribes he's speaking spiritually but they are listening and talking physically and they're missing the Savior's leadership they're missing the Savior's point so the first thing I want you to see is that Jesus is the true Shepherd and the Good Shepherd but the second thing in verses 7 through 10 Jesus now gives us a new metaphor and he says that he is the only door look at verse 7 with me so Jesus again spoke to the leaders of the Sanhedrin truly truly I mean I mean truth unto truth Jesus says I say to you I am the door of the sheep now they didn't understand this they didn't understand that he was describing himself this is salvation in its pure form no one no one will go to heaven unless they go through the door of the entrance into heaven and that door is Jesus Christ I don't care what a culture says I don't care how often Satan sells the lie there is not more than one way to go to heaven there is only one way there is not many truths you have your truth and I have mine do not force your truth upon me Satan will say you've heard it but there is absolute truth and Jesus is that truth and Jesus says the only way you can go to heaven is by going through me you must have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ or you will not go to heaven look at verse 8 Jesus says all who came before me are thieves and robbers but the sheep did not listen to them now Jesus is not saying that his prophets his leaders were thieves and robbers what Jesus is saying here is this is a description of all the false prophets all the false leaders the wicked kings and the corrupt priests Jesus is telling the Pharisees the Sadducees the chief priests and the scribes they are thieves and robbers spiritually speaking for it is they who were supposed to lead the people to God instead they led them away from God it is they who were supposed to lead the people to Jesus but instead they created a God in their image and their likeness and they led the people by fear and they led the people through ignorance they are spiritually blind they are biblically illiterate and they are biblically ignorant I plead with you today I plead with you today do not be spiritually blind it's a choice do not be biblically illiterate do not be biblically ignorant know the Word of God study the Word of God read the Word of God follow the Word of God and stand on God's truth verse 9 Jesus says I am a go I me the door if anyone enters by me he will be saved and he will go in and out and find pasture go to John chapter 14 Jesus gives us a very powerful statement here you've heard me say it many times John 14 verse 6 Jesus said I am the way I am the truth I am the life and no one no one no one comes to the Father except through me God offers salvation to every living human in the human race aren't you glad he does aren't you glad he does with the myriad of ethnicities that we have in the human race and I want to remind you there is not a black race there is not a white race there's not a Hispanic race 
There are ethnicities, but in the Bible, there is one race, and it is the human race. And He offers salvation to every single person in the human race. But Christianity is exclusive. And there's only one way to go to heaven. And that's by having a relationship with Jesus Christ. So for those of you in the room today who do not know Jesus personally as Lord and Savior, I'm so glad you're here. Because I want to tell you the truth. And the truth is, you will never be good enough to get to heaven. You can never work your way into heaven. The only way you can go to heaven is if you repent of your sin. That means you stop running away from God, you turn and you run to God. You confess your sin to Him. You ask for His forgiveness for what you've done in your life. And then by faith, you accept His gift, His offer of eternal life through His Son, Jesus Christ. That is how you walk through the door of salvation that Jesus offers. Isn't that great? Isn't it beautiful? Man, we have a message to share, don't we? We have something to tell. We got a story we need to get out there. The story of true life and true death. And Jesus, as the good shepherd, as the only door, is giving us this insight. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I want you to look at verse 18. For through Jesus, Paul says to the church at Ephesus, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Again, notice it's always through Jesus. There's no other way to get to the Father. There's no other way to get to heaven except through Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful the Bible makes it so clear. Go to John chapter 8, look at verse 44. If you remember last week, Jesus levied this incredible indictment to the leaders of the religious leaders of Israel. Jesus says, you are of your father the devil and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. Know your enemy. It's not the person standing in front of you that you can't stand. It's not the person sitting beside you that agitates you every day. Know your enemy. Because when you know your enemy, then you see things differently. And Jesus is encouraging his sheep to fight spiritually, to live spiritually, and to recognize your enemy. I'm grateful. I'm grateful when we choose to listen to God's voice because his leadership is always true. But when we choose to listen to Satan's voice, his leadership will always be in the darkness. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't even like you. All he wants to do is to destroy your life and to keep you from living for Jesus. And for those of you who don't know him personally, he just wants you to go to hell to join him. But that's not what God desires for your life. But you must choose. Jesus is the only door. Go to Romans 8. I want to show you how much God loves you and how much Jesus loves you. Romans 8, verse 32. For God did not even spare his own son, Jesus Christ. But God gave Jesus up for everyone, for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Feel the love. Hear the love. God loves us so much he commanded his son to give his life on the cross. Jesus loves us so much that he took your sin and my sin upon himself. And he got on the cross and took our place on the cross, the place we should have been, the place where we should have received our right punishment, our just punishment. He loves us so much that he took our place on the cross. God wants to have intimacy with you. Jesus is the only door that gives you access to that relationship. Third, We see that Jesus is the sacrificial shepherd. We see that in verses 11, 12, and 13. 
Look at what Jesus says in verse 11. He says, I am a go I me, the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The fourth statement that Jesus makes regarding who he is. In John 6, as I said earlier, he is the bread of life that came down from heaven, the living bread. In John 8, he is the I am, the eternal God. He is also the light in the dark world. And here, in John 10, Jesus is the good shepherd, and he was willing to sacrifice his life for every human in the human race. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Go to John 3. We knew this verse. We've studied this verse. We've memorized this verse since we were children. Look at verse 16. For God so loved the world. Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have, what is it? Say it again. That's how much God loves you. That's how much Jesus loves you. He wants you to have eternal life with him. Verse 17, God didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn it, but he sent Jesus into the world that the world might be saved through him. World meaning the human race. Aren't you glad that we have a true shepherd? Aren't you glad that Jesus is the only door for salvation? Aren't you glad that we have a sacrificial shepherd that laid down his life for us. Folks, this is the gospel. This is what God wants us to preach and to teach. What are you preaching? Every person in here is a preacher. The only difference is I get paid to do it. But every single person in this room is a preacher. You preach every day. Now the question is, is what kind of sermon are you preaching? Non-verbally and verbally, every single day of your life, you're preaching something. You're teaching something. You're showing people your theology, what you believe. What are you preaching? Are you preaching the gospel? Are you living the gospel? Man, this is a high standard, isn't it? I'm so grateful that God set the bar high. He wants us to be obedient to him. Verse 12, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters the sheep. See, hired hands are the opposite of a good shepherd. Hired hands are only there for the money. And so when things get tight, and things get a little tense and sometimes dangerous when the wolf comes or the bear comes or the lion comes the hired hand is not going to fight to protect the sheep he's going to fight to protect his life and so most of them leave and the sheep are left to their own demise go to Genesis chapter 2 I want to show you from the beginning what kind of shepherd we have. Genesis chapter 2, look at verse 7. We're in day 6 of creation. We've looked at this in previous sermons. God has spoken everything into existence. He spoke, Jesus created. But here, in verse 7 of chapter 2, God changes his course. Then the Lord God, the self-existent, eternal, true God, formed the man of dust from the ground. God didn't speak us into existence. God paused. And then Jesus created. He formed man from the dust of the ground. Intimately. Physically. And then when he was perfected. And man stood before God for the first time. Jesus breathed life, physical life, and he became a living person. But the Bible tells us in verse 7 that Jesus breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul. In the process of breathing physical life into man, Jesus also breathed spiritual life into a man, and he placed an eternal soul within him, within you, within me, 
And when our physical bodies die, our eternal soul will either go to heaven with him because we have a relationship with him, or it will go to hell because we do not. And our eternal soul will live in eternity in one of those two homes. Do you know the destination that you are going to when you die? It's something you should think about for those of you who do not have a relationship with God. It's something you should ponder. It's something you should weigh. Because when you die, before you die, you should know your home. Is it going to be heaven with God and Jesus and all the saints from the beginning of time until the time you die? Is that where you're going? Paradise? Or are you going to a place of torture and torment and darkness and anguish for all eternity because you chose to neglect God's offer of life to you? God formed you. Me. He shaped us. He fashioned us. Look around you today. You will not see yourself and anyone else physically. We are so uniquely designed. God wants intimacy with you, with me. But a hired hand, he will not fight for us. He will not even protect us. Verse 13, he flees because a hired hand cares nothing for the sheep. Go to 1 Peter 5. I want you to see your pastor represented here jesus christ represented here listen to the verse first peter chapter 5 look at verse 2 with me shepherd the flock it is the word poimen in the greek it means care for the flock of god that is among you exercising oversight not under compulsion but willingly as god would have you not for shameful gain but eagerly this is one of the passages of scripture that describes the office of the under shepherd in the church Look at the breakdown with me. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. You want to know something about being a shepherd of the church of Jesus Christ? Not everybody is going to agree with the way you care for them. Isn't that amazing? All the sheep are not going to like you for every decision that you make. Isn't that amazing? Being a shepherd of the sheep is a downright hard thing. It's a thankless thing. And if you're not called to do it, you better not get into it because being a pastor in the church of Jesus Christ is not for sissies because you're going to get punished. You're going to get hammered because people don't agree with everything you do all the time because we're different. Look at what it says. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. Do you catch that? Pastors are to exercise oversight for God to his people not under compulsion but willingly as god would have not for shameful gain but eagerly man i want to encourage you to pray for your pastors pray for the under shepherds of the church and when something happens and you disagree go to your pastor talk with your pastor one-on-one -on -one. Don't do it behind the bush. Don't do it with your friends and gossip. Go to your pastor because you love him and sit down with him. Can I talk with you about, can you explain for me? I had that happen recently by two members of our church. They loved me enough to come to talk to me and we had a great conversation. And my respect for them went up because they chose to come to talk to me about the subject on the table notice we are family we are sheep all of us it's a beautiful picture that Jesus gives us God has called the under shepherds to sacrifice I'll, I'll just be transparent with you I'm in a period of sacrifice right now I'm in a period of struggle right now. And I covet your prayers. 
I covet your prayers. Because I don't know where this is leading. And I don't know what it means. I don't have any answers. And there are moments like that for all of the sheep in God's family. My goodness, we need to pray for each other and encourage each other and sacrifice for each other, just like Jesus models. He is the true shepherd. He is the only door. He is the sacrificial shepherd. And finally, in the last four verses, he is Lord of all. Look at verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. There has never been a time when Jesus was not the living bread that come down from heaven. There has never been a time when he has not been the bread of life. There has never been a time when he has not been the light of the world. There has never been a time when he has not been eternal God or the good shepherd. He knows his sheep, and his sheep know him. And that comes through salvation. You and I, before Jesus needed to be delivered from our sins, and he is the only one who can deliver us. By faith, we must accept what he's done for us. By faith, we must choose to repent, to trust him implicitly. By faith, we must choose to serve him. By faith, we must know that he is the only way to heaven. By faith, we must trust God and the gift of provision he's given us through his son, Jesus Christ. Verse 15 He says, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Go to John chapter 1, verse 1. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There has never been a time when Jesus has not been eternal God. There has never been a time when he was not God, period. He was God before Eden. He was God after Eden. He was God with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was God with Moses. He is God now, and he will be God 50 generations from now. There will never be a millisecond when he will not be God. Verse 16, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold, but I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, for their will be one flock, one shepherd. And God's people said, amen. You know who he's talking about here? He's talking about you. He's talking about us. You want to know why I know that? Because he's a Jew, and he's talking to Jews. But he's referring here to other sheep, meaning Gentiles, those who would come to know him who were not Jews. And they're so grateful that Jesus died for everyone and not just the Jewish people. Man, that's good stuff. 17, for this reason the Father loves me, Jesus says, because I laid down my life that I may take it up again. Notice, because he's God, because he's doing the will of God, he can lay down his life and God gives him the authority to take his life back again. Verse 18, No one, no one, no one takes that from me. No one. The Romans didn't take Jesus' life. The Pharisees, Sadducees, chief priests, and scribes didn't take his life. Jesus gave his life for us so that we might experience deliverance from sin in a personal relationship with holy God. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, I want you to look at verse 8. Paul's writing to the church at Philippi, and he makes this statement. And being found in human form, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Aren't you glad? Jesus is the true shepherd. And for those of us who know him and have a relationship with him, when he speaks, we know his voice and we follow it. He is the only door. I'm so thankful that Christianity is exclusive. I'm so grateful there's only one way. I've had conversations, not too distant past, with people who are angry with God because how dare you say that I can't go to heaven on my own? Who do you think you are, quote unquote, 
that you would say such a thing. That's why I can't serve God, because God is not a nice person. What do you think? My response? Because he's God, he wrote the rules of the game, so he gets to do whatever he wants to do. I think that's pretty fair, don't you? And they looked at me and said, well, who do you think you are? I smiled. I said, I'm just a dumb sheep that serves a holy God, and he wants to have a relationship with you just like he does with me. That's why I'm here. And I'm grateful we're talking about this. And the conversation went on from there. He is the only door. My goodness, I'm so thankful there are not ten ways to get to heaven. Because then how would you know you got the right way? There are not two ways. Did I choose the right one? Did I 50-50 coin toss? Aren't you glad there's only one way? He is the sacrificial shepherd. Jesus gave it all for me. And when I was 17 and I had nowhere else to go, and I cried out to God for the first time in my life, he heard me and he answered my prayer. That's why I serve him. Because when nobody else gave a redneck from Donellan, Florida, of any chance to do anything of value, God gave me life. He's a sacrificial shepherd and he is Lord of all. I'm so grateful that God is Lord of everything, not just two-thirds or a sixteenth. He's Lord of it all. He is the living bread that came down from heaven. He is the bread of life. Salvation can only be found in him. He is the light of the world in a spiritually dark and spiritually depraved world that we live in right here, right now. He is the only one who can fill the void in your life. He is the only one who is the voice of reason and the voice of truth. He is light of the world. I'm so thankful that he is a go I me, eternal God. And I'm so thankful that he is a good shepherd. Do you know this Jesus that I speak of? Do you have a relationship with the one I'm describing? Pray with me. With heads bowed and eyes closed. For those of you in the room who do not recognize the God of whom I speak, I want you to know that he loves you. He brought you here today. You might not understand that, but you're here because he brought you here so that you could hear that he loves you, so that you can hear that he sent Jesus to die for you, and he wants to have relationship with you. All you have to do is repent. Just stop running away from God. And for the first time in your life, turn around and go to him what do I do I've never prayed to God before that's okay you just need to tell God about the garbage in your life tell him how you've sinned how you've missed the target that he has set for you the carnage that you have created in your life alcohol can't fill the need drugs can't satisfy the need nothing can fill the void in your life except Jesus Christ so just tell him God I'm sorry I'm sorry for what I've done and what I've said would you forgive me I don't want to live this way anymore and then by faith tell God you trust him Tell God you believe in him. Tell God that you accept his gift of life through Jesus Christ. And then tell him that you'll serve him for the rest of your life. You see, the church, Kathleen Baptist, the universal church of God, when you make that decision, we will come alongside you and we will show you and teach you how to live for Jesus and how to have a relationship with him so that he can change your life. All you need to do is make those decisions right now. In just a few moments, our musical team is going to lead us in song. I just want to ask you to come up front and give me, take my hand and tell me, Mike, I have faith.
and I have accepted God's gift of life through Jesus and I've repented and I've confessed my sin to him but I don't know how to walk with God man I want to show you what comes next because it'll blow your socks off it's just so cool to be in a relationship with God for those of you in the room that are in a relationship with Jesus thank you so much for serving Jesus every day I want to encourage you not to stop don't get sidetracked if you have moved away from God in any way in your life, would you repent? Would you also change course and come back to God? If it's been a while since you've led someone to salvation, to Jesus Christ, would you ask God to forgive you for not doing that, telling his story more often? If you're not in a discipleship relationship right now, teaching someone how to live for Jesus more intimately, more fervently, would you ask God to forgive you, repent of that? And choose right now to make a decision that you will be an actively engaged disciple of God, discipling others and showing them how to grow deeper in their faith. Whatever you need to confess to God, would you do that now? And if you need to come forward and bow quietly before the podium and talk with the Lord on your knees, do that. If you want to stay where you are, do that. But talk to God now. Talk to God. As the team leads in song, you reverently talk to God. Father, in this sacred, holy moment, please continue to speak. And I pray these men and women, boys and girls, would follow your leadership. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you for watching this week's sermon from Kathleen Baptist Church. For those that are in our faith family, we hope we can see you again soon. If there is any way we can serve you or pray for you, please contact us at the church office at 863-858-3836. For those not in our faith family, thank you so much for watching today. We would love to connect with you and hear from you to see if there is any way we can pray for you or serve you. We have life groups available for your family to plug into. You can contact us by calling the church office at 863-858-3836 or by going to our website, KathleenBaptist.com. There you can learn more about who we are, find resources for you and your family, see our upcoming events, and watch more of our sermons. We hope you will join us again next week for our service.